The Curbsiders are now partnering with VCU Health Continuing Education to offer CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. And today we want to give a shout out to our episode sponsor, Apollo Healthcare Technology. They're a tech company with an online platform that connects volunteers and healthcare providers to hospitals in need of staff. Due to the COVID pandemic, they are currently offering their services for free to any hospital affected by COVID-19. You can check out Apollo Healthcare Technology at apollohct.com. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly Cash Like More Hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Raul Canatra, Amy Okamoto, and Sarah Phoebe Roberts. This is the third episode of our special edition COVID Cake series, which is temporarily replacing our Hot Cakes Research Roundup. In a moment, our producer, Sarah Phoebe Roberts, will be letting you know more about what we'll cover in this episode. But first, Emmy, will you remind the audience what we do on the show? Definitely, Chris. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. But on these special episodes, we will be bringing you some of the latest and hottest research hot off the press to discuss with some of our experts and really piece through what this means for practice. On this episode, you're going to get the rundown on remdesivir with Raul Ganatra. And Emmy, Chris, and Raul will share a few highlights from new COVID-19 studies related to thrombosis, asymptomatic transmission, and antibody testing. All right. Well, let's get a couple of picks in. Emmy, since it's been a while since you've been on an episode, right? When was yeah. the last episode you've been on? Almost a year. Been out of the country. <laughs> but now I'm back. <laughs> what do you got for your pick of the week? Yes. Do you guys know You Bet Your Garden, the podcast? Oh. oh my gosh, you have to listen to it. It's uh, It used to be on WHYY, but, but now it's on a local radio station, but you can find it anywhere. And it's Mike McGrath, who is this longtime gardener who brings you outside and has this beautiful personality for how to garden. And it, it might sound like something dumb and flowery, but it, it really makes you laugh and makes you think about beautiful things and, and hopefully gets people outdoors and outside. So if you if you haven't heard it, I recommend checking it out. Cool. We um, here in uh, our our uh, area of Cash Lake Memorial, our faculty actually started this uh, garden interest group just to help relieve some of the stress with all the all the COVID stuff. Um, they they meet actually they met today at five o'clock. My wife's part of it, and um, they all talk about things between like planting seedlings and how to take care of critters in the yard and stuff like that. So I should make sure that they take a listen to that podcast. Yes, it's so interesting. Everyone can listen to to things about growth and life and regeneration, and, and it's it's beautiful nourishment for the soul, I think. Raul, do you got one? I sure do. It's also a podcast that some listeners may be familiar with. It's called Ologies. So Ologies is hosted by Allie Ward, who is a very smart, very funny science correspondent for CBS, um, and she's done some work with Mo Rocca in the past. The podcast is basically like a hour to two hour long deep dive on a really nerdy topic. So it's it's right up my alley. I just listened to an episode on bison and learned such uh, compelling animal facts as did you know that the species name for bison is actually bison bison? <laughs> so isn't, important stuff uh, like that. Isn't there a, a gorilla species? This gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I wonder what the animal is with the most repetition of species names. I feel like that's another rabbit hole I need to go down now. <laughs> I heard you well, were an animal you... person, Rahul. Is that, that must be true. I have not really delivered on that, uh, and I feel badly. And so in preparation for this, I know we have no time, but did you know that the bison is unique among mammals because it has a continuous plural cavity? Do you guys know this? Oh, no. no. Yeah. So that is part of the hypothesis for why they were able to be like wiped out so easily is if they get shot mm-hmm. with an arrow or a bullet or pierced with a spear, there is a high risk of tension pneumothorax because both lungs will collapse from a single puncture wound. Oh my God. All right. Well, this is going to be the hotcakes where I cry. Okay. 
that's fine. <laughs> oh, well, Sarah, Chris. What, you, you must have something that makes us happier. I do. First, to your point, it is apparently the Western Lowland Gorilla that is, in fact, Gorilla, Gorilla, Gorilla. So I just wanted to um, fact check mm. that and confirm that you are correct. My pick of the week um, is, are we allowed to say brand names of cereal on this podcast? I, I, I think uh, it won't count in the COI. It should be all right. Okay. All right. Um, so my pick of the week is Frosted Mini Wheats. Um, I've just found that they're a really excellent uh, quarantine comfort food, and I highly recommend them to anyone who hasn't had a bowl in a while. Yeah, hopefully that's not a conflict of interest. Dry or with uh, some sort of liquid in it? Excuse me? Is it, are, you, are you eating dry or with some sort of like milk in it? What kind of monster would... <laughs> well, I should, you know, sorry, I should Interesting. Is there, those are the mini wheats, but have you guys seen the big wheats? Like the there's, actual normal size wheats? macro wheats? Wheat? Yeah, it's like a whole bowl. Like a bread bowl, but made of a mini wheat. Yeah. <laughs> just I hope they are the called macro wheats. Macro wheats. <laughs> Mega wheats. Hey everyone, this is Matt, and I had to break in here because just two days before we were about to release this episode, the NIH released preliminary data from a randomized placebo-controlled trial of remdesivir showing that it may speed up recovery time, maybe even a trend towards benefit and mortality. So we will link to that in the show notes. There's also a recent study in the Lancet that came out, which was also a rem- randomized controlled trial of remdesivir. We'll link to both of those and we'll probably talk about them on future episodes. And now back to Chris. All right. I think we need to move on to our top pick of this week. Um, and I think Raul, you, since you're our you're our great expert here. You actually wrote a fantastic uh, tutorial that um, wanted to go out. Was that earlier this week or was it last week? Um, I published this on uh, April 18th. Do you want to tell us a little bit of the background on why you, why you looked at this, uh, at this case series and what made you interested in talking about it? Sure. Like most people, I'm trying to do what I can to read the literature and stay current. And just figuring out what to read has been a like a daily struggle for me. Um, and so I'm trying to focus it around the questions that friends and colleagues are asking each other during this time. And a lot of questions are coming up these days about treatment. And there has been a lot of buzz around this case series uh, on remdesivir in the New England Journal of Medicine. So um, I thought I would take uh, readers and listeners on kind of a guided tour of this paper and hopefully along the way uh, teach you some things about uh, critical appraisal. So to give you some background for this paper, this is um, a case series by Grain et al. And this was published um, in the New England Journal of Medicine um, about a week ago um, or two weeks now. Remdesivir is an ATP analog that inhibits a bunch of viral polymerases in vitro, um, including SARS, including MERS. Um, And this was tried in a randomized controlled trial of four drugs for Ebola, but uh, remdesivir was unfortunately ineffective. And currently, it doesn't have an FDA-approved indication for use. So the question that these authors were asking was, what were the outcomes among patients hospitalized with COVID-19 who received remdesivir on a compassionate use basis from the manufacturer. So this was published on the 10th of April, 2020, and it was funded by Gilead Sciences, the manufacturer of the drug. This was a case series, and it included 61 patients who were hospitalized in several countries, and they all had to have severe COVID-19, and their treating clinicians had to seek uh, remdesivir by compassionate use uh, from Gilead. The intervention in this study was remdesivir 200 milligrams on day one, followed by 100 milligrams for nine more days for a total of 10-day course, in addition to usual care, okay? The usual care varied at each hospital. At a minimum, this included non-invasive or invasive oxygen support. There was no control group in this study. The way the study was carried out was that treating clinicians submitted an application for remdesivir to Gilead, and then patients who were approved got the 10-day course plus usual care, which was uh, at the discretion of their treating clinicians. And they reported clinical and laboratory data daily through day 10, and then kind of intermittently thereafter that. Inclusion criteria, hospitalized patients with PCR-confirmed SARS-CoV-2, and they also had to have uh, an oxygen saturation less than 94% on room air or a need for supplemental O2. Patients with renal impairment, hepatitis, or use of any other investigational drug were excluded from this study. So no primary outcome was specified for this study, um, but the authors report uh, a bunch of relevant endpoints. 
cumulative incidence of clinical improvement, which they define as uh, greater than two levels of improvement on uh, the WHO ordinal scale uh, that's being used a lot for trials of uh, COVID-19. Um, live discharge, change in oxygen support, adverse events, mortality. The primary analysis in the study was purely descriptive. The duration of follow-up was 28 days. Eight of the 61 patients were lost to follow-up. Um, seven of them contributed no post-treatment data, and one of them got the wrong dose of remdesivir. Okay, so what did the study show? Well, to start with their table one, the median age of included participants was 64, and 75% of them were male. 40% of them were from the United States, 40% from Europe or Canada, and 20% were from Japan. The median duration of symptoms before receipt of remdesivir was 12 days, okay? And at baseline, a lot of these patients were quite sick. Like over half of them were intubated, 8% of them required ECMO, um, only 4% of them uh, were on room air at the time of enrollment. So there was a fairly sick population. So the authors found that at a median of 18 days after starting remdesivir, 36 of the 53 patients, which is 68%, uh, improved, and 15% of the patients worsened. By day 28, they found that 47% of patients in this case series were discharged, 23% had an improvement in their oxygen support required, 15% were unchanged, 2% worsened, and 13% died. So the authors um, also report on uh, adverse events. And you know a lot of patients experienced adverse events. It was 60% uh, had anything reported. 23% um, of those were serious. The most common were transaminitis, uh, diarrhea, rash, and AKI. And among that group, uh, about 8% of the patients had to stop remdesivir early due to an adverse event. So based on all this, the authors conclude that despite the lack of a control group, you know, when they compare their observed mortality rate of 13% in this really sick patient group with that seen in other published reports, this suggests that remdesivir may have benefits in patients with severe COVID-19. So I'll start with a question to the group. Um, so the authors point out that you know the sample size was small, the follow-up was short, there was missing data, there was no control group. They kind of... You, cite those as limitations of the study. I'm curious if anybody has thoughts, you know, accepting those problems, are there other sources of bias that we have to think about that could threaten that suggestion that remdesivir is promising? Is there anything that stuck out to anybody as they were reading this? Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, where do these patients come from? We we have thousands of cases in, in the U.S. and and I've read on the news a lot of people applying for remdesivir and, you know, waiting it. And so the question is, kind of who are who is being allowed to get remdesivir and how how were were they selected in some way did it have to do something with their their clinical state before so it's hard to compare this group against you know the nation when when we don't really know what were the baseline characteristics that made this group get the medication I mean that is such an important observation. You've basically identified what, in my view, is kind of you know fully half of the important stuff to appraise about a case series. So it, it's really tempting to think that descriptive studies are less vulnerable to bias than studies where a comparison is made, but this is not the case. And we can ask two questions to try and get at this. One is how did patients get into the study, okay? And then two is how did data or outcomes come out of the study? And the first question is really all about looking for selection bias. So, Amy, to your point, for a patient to be included in this study, number one, their treating clinicians had to apply for remdesivir. Number two, Gilead had to approve remdesivir for those patients. And number three, the patients had to complete the remdesivir protocol. And each step in that process introduces the, the potential for selection bias if there is a lot of loss between each step. And if the total number of applications for remdesivir that Gilead received was really large, then this really inflates this risk. And it makes me worry that these results could be more reflective of the kind of patient who got remdesivir rather than remdesivir itself. And we can gauge this quantitatively um, in the uh, consort diagram showing how patients entered the study. Uh, authors commonly report how many patients were screened uh, for inclusion. And in this a study in the supplement, um, their concert diagram does not include how many patients were screened. And so we, we really need to know how many patients um, uh, or how many applications they received for compassionate use in order to evaluate that. And also patients who get an expanded access medication are probably different from patients who don't. And clinicians who submit an application are probably different from those who don't. And 
because of those observations, it's really hard to know who to generalize the results of this study to. Like you brought up, Emmy, it's hard to know, you know, if these results should apply to critically ill patients, patients in the United States, patients in other countries, um, because we don't know what criteria went into selecting patients, it's hard for us to say. The other thing I'll mention is that the time from symptom onset to receipt of remdesivir was 12 days, which means that patients had to survive the first 12 days of COVID-19 to be eligible for the study. Um, Early series from Wuhan indicate that the median time from onset to ARDS was like eight days. So this, you know, raises concern that this could be um, a, a population of patients who uh, were predisposed to do better. And then the authors kind of compare this to other published reports. They cite a mortality rate of 66% among intubated patients in uh, a, a study in JAMA. A subsequent uh, series uh, from Italy um, quotes a mortality rate among ICU patients of 26%. Um, of which almost all of them were intubated. So the the comparison is is probably not to something like 66%. It's probably closer to, to 25, 26. So the last thing to talk about is how did data come out of this study? Well, that's all asking about ascertainment bias. And looking at their figure uh, of individual trajectories for each patient, um, this is figure two in the manuscript, um, we see that patients who were sicker at baseline, patients who were intubated or on ECMO were less likely to be followed until clinical improvement, discharge, or death. And I'm determining this just by looking at the eight patients with none of those outcomes reported. All of them were intubated at baseline. So the most likely situation is that they were just still hospitalized at the end of the study period, but because they did not contribute complete person time data, we just don't know what happened to them. And since they were sicker than the patients who did contribute complete follow-up data, this creates a situation called ascertainment bias. So the bottom line for me uh, about this study, uh, you know, without a control group, it's really impossible to tell whether the observed outcomes in this highly selected population are due to remdesivir or if they are attributable to who received remdesivir. Selection bias really limits comparison to other cohorts um, as well as the generalizability of these results. Um, I feel like a broken record having said this more than once now, but what we need to answer this question is uh, a well-designed randomized control trial. Well, that's always the right answer. Um, so when this study first came out, Joel Topf, um, friend, friend of the pod, um, the salt whisperer himself, he, he came out actually super excited on Twitter. Now he got a lot of backlash, which I, you know, I think he was very excited that at least it looked like there was a possibility of using this medication and came out very excited on Twitter. And, um, but then he got a lot of backlash, which I, I don't think was, was necessarily warranted because he was just trying to, you know, we're all looking for treatments that we can do for this, this horrible virus. And, um, you know, yes, it's not a great study, but, um, I think his, his enthusiasm was, was well warranted because we're all looking for great things. Um, hopefully that will, will help, help us through this. Um, Sarah, you reached out to Joel and to ask him for some comments on, um, on his, his thoughts. Do you, are you able to summarize what he, he told you? Absolutely. Um, yes, Dr. Toff was kind enough to share some of his perspectives on the study, um, which you just mentioned. Um, so I'm going to, to paraphrase some of the things that he said. Um, he gave a, a really excellent summary of, of why he felt this trial was, um, even with its limitations, still, still very meaningful. He noted that you know, this is not a trial in, in the sense it's not an RCT, and there's no way to infer that the drug works from an uncontrolled collection of subjects, which we just discussed. Um, rather, it's Gilead uh, produce, excuse me, publishing their experience with a compassionate use program. So, you know, he mentioned some of the other limitations that we just discussed about um, sample size. Um, and he notes that, you know, what he really feels excited about is that, you know, Gilead has a very good track record with viruses. He cites specifically um, tenofovir, the first combination drug to control HIV uh, with a once daily pill, and also with the hep C cure, lidipasvir or sofosbuvir. The outcomes and other reasons that he stated for, for having enthusiasm about the trial is that the patient outcomes look good compared to what he's seeing in the ICU, that the adverse events seem reasonable given the morbidity of the population, which Rahul discussed. He did express concern about the, I believe, eight patients that there were not uh, results on. And I think an interesting note is, as Chris mentioned, you know, there, we, we collectively in, in health and public health need to feel some sense of hope. And there is importance in that sense of um, 
change or hope and feeling like the cavalry was on the way is the term that um, Dr. Taupe used. And lastly, he, he drew an important distinction from the hydroxychloroquine study. Uh, he noted that remdesivir is not licensed for any indication and can only be prescribed as part of a protocol. And also there are four placebo controlled trials coming down the pipe, um, two by Gilead, uh, one by NIH, and one by the World Health Organization. So we'll have more results from those in the next two months, which will give us additional evidence about how to interpret this initial study and what to think about remdesivir as a treatment in general. Now, it's always the question if, you know, if you had a very sick patient in the ICU who you really want to do well, would, would you guys be calling up Gilead and, and trying to get them in the clinical trial or under the compassionate use? What, what do you think? I, don't, I think probably my, my answer would be, I think it might be worth a shot. I mean, some of these patients who are so sick and, you know, we, we actually reached out to a friend of the pod, Dr. Paul Sachs as well. And I really liked his, uh, his, his comment, which I think is a good way to wrap this up because we have to move on. He said, it may work and it doesn't appear to be overly toxic. And that's about all we can say from this uncontrolled study. Yeah. Even though I, you know, I've kind of made my case for why I don't think the you know, we can infer that this is promising based on this study. I mean, we can still use this data to try and make a intelligent inference about how it might be useful. And the fact that patients in this study, there was this median of 12 days from symptom onset to treatment, you know, I mean, it it makes you wonder if there might be a role for this medication in an earlier stage of the disease. And that's something that was really not uh, evaluated in this study at all. So I would look to other randomized trials for um, you know, prevention or for treatment earlier in the disease um, as, as a, a possible avenue to investigate. All right. We're going to move on from our top story this week to a couple of our, um, what we're going to call them medium bites, <laughs> so the quick bites. Um, I think the first one I'm sort of going to talk a little bit about, uh, probably a lot of people who are taking care of COVID patients or have been reading about COVID know that uh, thrombosis is a, is a large concern. We do know that COVID-19 patients, there are an increase for uh, VTE and DIC. And so there are lots of different treatments and prevention that, strategies that have been discussed. You know, um, I think several of us have, have looked at comparable institutions and each have their own uh, separate guidelines as well as guidelines from some of the larger uh, institutions. What we do know is that, you know, severe cases of COVID-19, people develop ARDS, septic shock metabolic acidosis and DIC. Um, and, you know, with COVID-19, a lot of these patients have, you know, lots of hematologic abnormalities and seem to have a much higher risk of VTE. So a lot of discussions have been between what to do with patients who are stable on the floor, people who are in the ICU, and then outpatients are some of the, so the large, broad areas of patients that we're looking at and trying to decide, should we anticoagulate them or not? I think overall, I think... Now, some of the guidelines that we have from a couple, couple different places. I don't know, Emmy, were you the one who, who who found these interim guidelines from International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis? Was that you? Yeah, so on this topic, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, um, something I, I've never heard of before this, but seems to be coming out strong, has come out saying that this is important. We know this. Some useful things is is when they come in, check the D-dimer, the PT, and the platelet count on all COVID-admitted patients. In that order of preference, they want the D-dimer um, most. PT is important, platelet count a little less so. And you can use those to guide care. In particular, see kind of who may need the ICU, who may need more aggressive care, um, when you see those numbers getting better, who is improving? And in particular, D-dimer may predict this uh, more severe disease and mortality. And so they also, in that, recommend prophylactic low molecular weight heparin in all admitted patients who don't have contraindication, which is kind of general for what we do for an admitted patient. Um, although there there was some some commentary then that that came saying, maybe maybe that's not strong enough. And I, I think we've heard that some hospitals are going ahead and empirically anticoagulating people, not just prophylactically, but a full dose. Yeah. And I think that's what 
um, looking at different internal guidelines that different people have shared with me, that's probably the ma major difference is how people are deciding where, when to do like intermediate dosing versus full anticoagulation versus just prophylactic anticoagulation. I think a commonality I've noted between a lot of guidelines are, or in internal guidelines are that uh, low molecular weight heparin is the preferred um, instead of using heparin, uh, which may cause um, more, more touches by the nurse so that they don't so that you could reduce the amount of PP needed to uh, to treat these patients. I think that's one thing that seems to be echoed over and over again by um, many different people. Now, this this preprint Wuhan study, was was that from you, Raul? Uh, not, not I. Okay, I mean, what, what, what do we have here? I, I, I couldn't remember who, who brought this one up. Oh, yes. So looking to see where this data is coming from there, there are some studies that are starting to come out. I think we'll see more coming up quickly. But it was looking from Wuhan, China, they looked at 449 patients and compared heparin users and non users. And again, this isn't a randomized control trial, we're just observational looking at what happened. And while there was no difference in 28 day mortality among all patients, it was about 30% for both groups. If you did look at those patients with the highest risk, and, and that was the D-dimer six times above the upper limit of normal, which is being seen in, in a lot of these COVID-19 patients, or the SIC or sepsis-induced coagulopathy score of over four, there was actually a mortality difference to the rate of, for the D-dimer, it was uh, only 33% in those who got treatment dose heparin versus 52% in those who didn't. And for the the sepsis-induced coagulopathy score, that was high. Those who got heparin had a 40% mortality versus a 64% mortality among those who didn't. So again, we, we don't know a lot about these patients or where they're coming from, but it kind of gives us more information that there there is some evidence that there's maybe microthrombosis and to some extent there may be pulmonary embolisms happening, some of the coronary things may all be related to this hypercoagulopathy, which is causing some people to say, hey, let's put everyone on low molecular weight heparin, or even let's put them on DOAX, I've seen in some guidelines, so that, as you were saying, it's kind of the the least touches possible for nursing, just the, the one pill a day, and and see what happens. Yeah, I've seen a lot of guidelines I'll talk about DOAX, um, the low molecular weight heparin, and then um, for patients who are coming in on um, on warfarin, they're discontinuing them on unless there is any other reason to change them over to um, full anticoagulation. Yeah, this is a I think a difficult situation that we don't have a lot of inf information on yet. So hopefully, we'll um, over the next couple of weeks we'll have um, much more data coming out on this. Um, I think another another area um, we're I was talking about earlier is in an outpatient setting. I think right now uh, most most people are not recommending uh, routine prophylactic anticoagulation for our patients who are being treated with COVID nineteen at home, um, unless anyone else has heard anything different from other people. I mean, I'm really struck by how sick this patient population was. I mean, you know, we're talking 28 day mortality in the you know neighborhood of 40, 50 percent. That's that's really quite high. So I understand why people are uh, eager to you know try and use these data to inform what the what the right thing is to do for these patients. Um, I will say that in the absence of randomization, the, the big thing you have to worry about is, well, one of the things you have to worry about is uh, a phenomenon called confounding by indication. Um, and that is basically asking the question is, is it the case that patients who were sicker were more or less likely to get a drug that you're trying to study? And in this case, the fact that there was no difference in 28-day mortality in the primary analysis doesn't suggest that that is happening, but in the group of patients who were sicker um, is uh, gauged by this higher um, uh, SIC score, you have to wonder, you know, is it that they got uh, heparin because they were sicker and people are kind of aware of this risk? So it's a really hard question and it's hard to answer. Um, and I, I would not fault people for trying to do the right thing uh, when you're taking care of patients that are this sick. I think, um, one thing I saw on Twitter recently, one of my friends, Ivy Cooper, who is a pulmonary critical care doctor, um, he, he was saying, you know, before all this, he, he used to poo-poo uh, getting D-dimers and now he takes them all the time. So it's something that's definitely changed our practice uh, immensely. 
Um, all right. Well, this could be a whole episode on zone, I think, especially when we get more data. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. Emmy, do you want to talk a little bit about pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic transmission? Yeah. First, I had a question for you guys. What does a New York City pregnant woman, an NBA player, and an Icelander all have in common? They're asymptomatic errors? <laughs> oh. um. Oh. They they all have been documented to have asymptomatic and presymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Could be anyone, right? We have choir groups, we have people on Navy ships, we have people in China, all over the world. Uh, we're getting more and more data that that presymptomatic and asymptomatic transmission is a thing. When the the earlier studies really didn't talk as much that this was a big deal. So the most striking one to me, which I don't think is representative, was just the editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine about the New York City Hospital Pregnancy Ward, where they tried to do universal testing and said how many people actually have the infection. So they had 215 women who presented to give birth, four of which had symptoms and tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, so that's 2%. Of the remaining 211 people, they were all asymptomatic. 29 ended up testing positive on a nasopharyngeal swab, which is 14%. So that means in total of all those who had the disease, only 88% actually, sorry, 88% didn't have symptoms. And then, so they, they followed them through the hospital stay, which was a mean of two days, and they, they found that three of those are 10% developed fever. So those would be the pre-symptomatics that they identified. And, and since they didn't follow these women longer, we, we don't know how many actually would go on to develop symptoms and be pre-symptomatic or who would stay asymptomatic and, and potentially transmit had they not had testing sooner. So that, that to me was one of the most shocking examples. We do see this elsewhere too, but often in lower numbers where people are doing universal testing, like in Iceland where they just do thousands of the population and see a, a large um, percent, I think it was around 1% um, of certain populations they were testing and, and so many of them didn't know because they didn't have symptoms. So I think paying more attention to, to this. And in, in particular, trying to model it, I, I really liked a paper in Nature Medicine. It was called Temporal Dynamics in Viral Shedding and Transmissibility of COVID-19. So this is one of those studies where I might do one of the hand-wavy things on, on the math and statistics here, but I will say it, they involved a, a gamma and log normal distributions, and they ended up doing a double integral, and, and they were nice and left the math and the stats at the end. But basically what they did is they looked at 77 pairs of infectors who gave the virus to infectees, and they really pared it down to, to where they thought that the transmission was clear and certain and that there weren't other exposures going on. And so of these 77 pairs, they're looking at two intervals. One is the incubation period. So the period from getting the virus to the period of showing symptoms. And we have a lot of data on that distribution. We believe the mean is around 5.2 days. The median is around 5.2 days. Sorry, the mean is slightly longer because that's how averages work. Then they looked at the serial interval distribution. Now this is the time between symptoms of the infector and then the time between symptoms of the person who got infected. And so the study says that the observed mean serial interval, the, the time between the person giving it to the next and getting symptoms, is shorter than the observed mean incubation period. And this indicates that a significant portion of transmission occurs before symptoms. So this one I had to think about a few times, right? So the, the time between the serial interval, which is the time between the first person showing symptoms and the second person showing symptoms, was shorter than what you would expect the incubation period. 
Chris, you're nodding your head. Yeah, so that means they had to actually have been exposed before that then, because during asymptomatic spread. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't really make sense for how someone's getting the virus faster than how they'd be expected to show symptoms. Now, it, it's not a perfect study. There are still biases. It, the symptoms were reported of both the infector and the infectee. We, we don't know exactly that the, the infectees weren't getting it elsewhere, although they felt fairly confident. But what they were able to show through modeling is that on average, they thought the infection was occurring about 0.7 days prior to when symptoms were starting. And they thought at the earliest that that this is occurring 2.3 days prior to symptoms in some of the most drastic cases that um, they were modeling. And in in general, looking at one of the area under the curves, this would be 44% were transmitting before symptoms were occurring. Scary. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot. And and again, it's not a perfect study. And and you'll see in in different cohorts um, that you model, it might look different. For example, in, in places where they have very high levels of contact tracing, as soon as someone has symptoms, they're very well aware. They've identified that they may be contact. And so um, they kind of pull people out of the pool so they can't transmit. So there's much more asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission happening when there's very good contact tracing than post-symptomatic. Gotcha. Were there any biases in the study that you, you, that you noted? Yeah, I, I think just we, you can't really say for sure, you know, if, if infection happened elsewhere. And it, it does rely a lot on patient recall. Now, so if 44% of people transmit before they have symptoms, should we, this is why we're all wearing masks. Is this right? Yes. The, the masks, especially the CDC went on to, to say recently that the public should be wearing cloth face masks. And they, they pretty clearly say that cloth face masks are to protect others and really not necessarily meant as protection for yourself, although it may, it may give some protection. Now, you have a couple other studies talking about masks that you want to bring up? Yes, masks. I, I wonder, are you guys, when you go outside, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? What are you wearing? Usually, uh, yeah, some type of mask. My mom just made me two cloth masks, actually, and sent them to me. So, Do you know what a buff is? Yeah, from Survivor. <laughs> that is a throwback. What's, what's, a, what's a buff? I have no idea what that is. A buff is a multi-purpose, flexible, stretchy piece of fabric that you can use as a scarf or a hat or a face covering. <laughs> it works really well for, like, running outside because it, like, covers kind of your whole, like, mouth and face and you can like pull it like up behind your head it's it kind of stays in place so I, I use that when i go outside like not to work and then when i'm going to work i use a cloth mask and then put on a surgical mask when i get there chris how about how about where you are i, or people I have a surgical masks? mask that i wear a surgical mask um whenever i'm anywhere so yeah i'm pretty impressed to see people in my town all i'd say 80 90 percent are are in their masks yeah yeah, and and so so why right? Do, do they work? There's a lot of of varying studies out there of of varying degrees, but two that I liked. One um, showed up in again in Nature Medicine, saying that and this was studying a number of different respiratory viruses. One was coronavirus happening between 2013 and 2016. So this was not SARS-CoV-2. But they had 17 patients who were infected with coronavirus who put on surgical masks and then tried um, studying also without surgical masks. And what they found was that surgical masks led to a decrease in the aerosols of coronavirus, going from 40% of the aerosols having it to zero from different people, and a decrease in droplets from 30% to zero. Uh, when these people were breathing and coughing. So I thought that was a positive indication. Again, you know, it's not SARS-CoV-2, and it's not a perfect study, but it does tell us that it is reducing droplets and aerosols. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, I'm just bringing up something I I hear too, because you could read everything in the news. And uh, there was another paper published in the annals 
with four patients with SARS-CoV-2, which just goes to show, I, I think we're at a time where information is shared so rapidly and so fast that if you can get four patients together, you, you can have a big enough end to, to publish a study because people are really wanting to see what's out there and what's happening. This so they really interesting, I thought. Yeah, yeah. So the, the four patients with SARS-CoV-2, they went through three different states. No mask, face mask of cloth, surgical mask, and then again to no mask. And so they had them cough five times towards a Petri dish, 20 centimeters away, and see what could grow. And what they found was that there was no difference between having no mask, having a face mask, or having a surgical mask. In so many of the times, the Petri dish was infected and was able to grow a culture of SARS-CoV-2. So, I mean, the, the thing is... We have all these studies. Like, so of, I, I, mm-hmm. I grew up in America. I don't know what twenty centimeters is. Is that how is that six, is that the six feet that people are away from me? Is that close? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. How close is that? I think it's about eight inches. I see someone has a ruler. So that that's the thing. Yeah, eight inches to a petri dish. And what is a petri dish? We have no idea what the inoculation is. You know, if is it's not really realistic to be that close to people. So I, I think it just teaches us we really need to be critical when looking at all these different face mask studies and, and realize we'll never have a randomized control po- study on the population to see kind of what's best. But uh, right now I, I was reading an editorial that talked about the precautionary principle that's According to Wikipedia, a strategy of approaching issues of potential harm when extensive scientific knowledge of the matter is lacking. And so I think we are just following that right now, and and we'll all try and make it through without spreading it too much. So, Amy, we we just talked about asymptomatic carriers um, a lot, and I think a, a big thing that has come up in the media is about antibody testing because it will be able to then test patients who... Um, or test people in the general public who may have been already exposed and have gotten over um, having SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so the FDA actually had a letter um, that, we, that I read that was in uh, J-Watch, um, but they talked about not using serological antibody testing as a sole diagnosis for COVID-19. I think this makes a lot of sense because um, when you're looking at antibody testing, you're um, looking for IgM and IgG, and that doesn't necessarily tell you if they're actively having infection or not because you still have to develop those antibodies. So I think that's something that sort of came up. You know, there was, there was you know, 90-some different um, companies that were trying to do antibody testing, and I think right now the FDA has approved four for emergency use authorizations or EUAs. So you'll probably see that in the news. Um, Raul, you read, you read a little bit something about this Santa Clara study. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. There's a preprint that has been making the rounds uh, in the news and on Twitter uh, that is a study that came out of Stanford University. And these researchers were basically asking the question, what is the prevalence of antibody positivity to SARS-CoV-2 in Santa Clara County? And so to answer this question, they used uh, Facebook ads to target a sample of adults in Santa Clara County for testing. And they were able to obtain uh, blood for serology from a little over 3,300 people. And they found that the um, prevalence of antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in Santa Clara County using one of these commercial tests uh, was um, varied between uh, 2.8 and 4.16%. Um, of the entire county. Now, their, their crude rate was only uh, 1.5%, but they had to adjust for the fact that their population was not representative of Santa Clara County as a whole. So using demographic uh, variables, they uh, changed their estimates to, to try to reflect that. And they also uh, estimated this under different uh, test characteristics. The only point I will make about this study uh, it's still a preprint, so you have to be very careful about appraising these things. Um, that when the prevalence of disease you're testing for is really low, the characteristics of the test uh, can have a really huge impact on the number of false positives uh, and the ratio of false positives to true positives. And in fact, for a prevalence of less than 5%, if you have even a minute drop in the sensitivity, or excuse me, a drop in the specificity of the test, 
um, you could have more false positives than true positives. So further study will be needed to really clarify this issue. Um, the bottom line is that it seems likely that we are under ascertaining the true amount of infections in the community using the PCR test alone. I don't have anything else to talk about that. So let's go on to our next um, quick take. Um, so Dr. Paul Sachs, we bring him again, friend of the show. Um, he has his great ID blog and his recent one, he, um, he titled IDSA COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Highlight Difficulty of don't just do something, stand there. And I think he pretty much talks about the problem that there's no proven effective treatment of COVID-19 and that basically, you know, there's a sort of these guidelines that keep on coming up have like a Groundhog Day-like quality saying that basically use of this potential treatment in context of a clinical trial could be recommended. And that's about it. Does that sound right to everyone who uh, sound like a good summary? <laughs> Yes, only in the context of a clinical trial is basically the answer to, do you want to try this treatment for this patient? Yep. So I encourage everyone to get who gets a chance to read his blog just in general, but this this um, this one post is pretty good. Hydrochloroquine follow-ups. Any, any new updates on that, Raul or Emmy, Sarah? Yeah, just, just quickly that, you know, early data was that, you know, could it work? And, and now we're getting new data, just a Quickly, a study from the VA on 368 patients found that there was no evidence of really benefit and that the rates of death in the hydrochloroquine group versus no hydrochloroquine group was actually higher. So it's, again, we still proceed with caution. This is a perfect example of where you have to worry about confounding by indication. The protocol at most hospitals that I'm aware of, you know, only recommended experimental treatments like hydroxychloroquine for patients who were really severely ill. So you have to ask, you know, have we satisfactorily answered this question or not? I have not kept up with the barrage of literature about hydroxychloroquine since uh, my initial review, but I remain, uh, you know, skeptical of use um, outside of the setting of a clinical trial. All right, Sarah, did you want to bring up this, uh, this article from the New York Times? Sure, yeah. Um, so the New York Times recently published a uh, what I found to be a somewhat comforting article that my actually sent to our family group chat. Um, it's entitled, Is the Virus on My Clothes, In My Shoes, My Hair, My Newspaper? Uh, we asked the experts to answer questions about all the places coronavirus lurks or doesn't. You'll feel better after reading this. And indeed, I did. Um, I think it was kind of a, it was like a nice article just for practically understanding what our appropriate safety measures in terms of just our daily activities. Um, I will note there is a, a different article um, in the same vein about how wide of a berth you need to be giving people if you're going out for a socially distanced run. And it sounds like it is actually, uh, you need to give more distance than you do when you're walking around. So the six feet rule doesn't seem to apply if you're running, you need to be more careful. And I think they said something like 15 feet. Whoa. Yeah, I, I'll find the article so people can actually look at the exact numbers, but it was interesting because they interviewed some people who are experts in uh, like aerosol dynamics and all of these other things that I don't know very much about. Um, so it was, it's like a very easy to read practical um, uh, article that I think is, is kind of a nice break from some of the more intensive literature that we are usually consuming. And that's something I never would have thought about that. Of, of course, you're breathing harder. If you stand further away, that makes sense now that I think about it. Well, they talked about, and again, this is a different article than the one I'm, I'm mentioning now, but I, I will post that one in the show notes. Um, the one with the running is they talk about uh, like airstreams. Um, people listening can't see me gesturing, but I'm uh, I'm I'm thinking of the um, when you exhale and then sort of the the draft, I guess, that carries it back behind you. There's more force there. There's there's something about again about wind dynamics and aerodynamics that I just don't understand. But the article does a good job of explaining why you need to give more space in that uh, instance. But you still should still go out and run because it's healthy and good for you. Right, right. We don't need to stay inside our, our prison. Well, I think that's a great way to end the show. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get the show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcasts and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review on 
Apple Podcasts, or contact thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Sarah Phoebe Roberts, as well as actually everyone else. <laughs> I think we're all producers <laughs> we're on this episode. We're all producers on this episode. I also want to give a special thanks to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garb Garbatelli on Instagram, and I guess I'm on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Chris the Chew Man Chew. I've been Emmy Elizabeth Okamoto. This has been Sarah Phoebe Roberts. And thanks to Stuart for composing our theme music and to Claire Morgan of Notterly for editing our audio. This has been Rahul Ganatra. Thank you, stay safe, and good night. And thanks to our partner, VCU Health Continuing Education, who's helping us offer free CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information.